as well, who are Lauren Turner and Jen Sebring. Um, Jen, I have not had a chance to ask you if that is how you say your last name. Would you mind telling me if that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Spotlight for everyone. Sorry, Lauren. I promise you'll be joined by Jen in a second. Oh, but then they disappeared. Oh, of course they did. Wow, am I 100 years old? Maybe. Oh, there you are. You were right beside me. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay, brilliant. So that's Lauren and Jen. They're our presenters for the night. Um, I am going to jump right in and tell you a bit about uh, our evening, and, uh, and then we'll get going. So welcome. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Uh, we do have Tom Rosenall and Sarah DeLeo here with us tonight who uh, Tom Rosenall is the current president of the Canadian Association for Health Humanities. And Sarah DeLeo is the soon to be president or, or future president rather of the CAHH and the current president of the League of Canadian Poets. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight at the second iteration of our Cross Pollinations virtual round series. Um, the League of Canadian Poets, oh, sorry, um, uh, I'm going to read our land acknowledgement. I have been getting people to share what they know of the land they're situated on in the chat, which I really appreciate. I'm not going to read them um, because I like to practice and research before I speak them out loud. So I'm just going to read ours, but I really appreciate you guys um, sharing that in the chat and I encourage you to take a look. The League of Canadian Poets would like to acknowledge that our office is situated upon traditional territories. These territories include the Wendat, Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. The treaty that was signed for this particular parcel of land is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase. We also recognize that many people are joining us from near and far, and that land acknowledgements can become a bit rote over time. So we'd encourage you to encourage, uh, sorry, we'd encourage you to research the history of the land that you live on work on, and peruse the chat to see where people are joining us from. If you're interested in learning more about this history, we recommend you research local Indigenous organizations. There is also an excellent free course on Coursera uh, that anyone can take available through the University of Alberta, um, and it's a free course on Indigenous Canada, so we'd highly recommend that as well. Thank you all for joining us. Um, the Canadian Association for Health Humanities, so one of the partners for this series, um, is uh, sorry, it exists to promote the exchange of ideas and critical dialogue among scholars and practitioners, as well as foster collaborative explorations nationally and internationally. Through meetings, publications, and related activities, the CAHH seeks to facilitate initiatives as well as interdisciplinary cross-professional inquiry into research and educational practices relevant to the health humanities. The League of Canadian Poets is a national nonprofit organization that through awards, funding, and other programming helps to support poets and poetry in Canada. And this series, this series of monthly rounds focused on health, arts, and humanities uh, are featuring both artists and professionals in the health humanities field to generate a multifaceted conversation about topics related to healthcare, art, healing, and humanities. Um, I promise we're so close to hearing from Jen and Lauren. I am just now gonna tell you a bit about them. So um, I'm Nick, by the way, I'm Nick Brewer. I work for the League of Canadian Poets <laughs> um, and I use she, her pronouns. Jennifer Hammond Sebring, our speaker, Jen Sebring, is a Master of Science student in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. Jen is an artist activist scholar whose work engages narratives of illness and social studies of medicine through a feminist lens. They have publications in Crossings, Marvels and Tales, and Still Living the Edges, a disabled woman's reader. They currently work as a research assistant on the SSHRC funded project, Bodies in Translation, Activist Art, Technology, and Access to Life. Their thesis looks at the effect of repeated healthcare encounters experienced by women and gender diverse people living with chronic illness. Jen's research is supported by Research Manitoba, and they are a sex and gender science trainee through CIHR's Institute of Gender and Health. They hold an honors BA in Women's and Gender Studies from the University of Winnipeg. Their presentation tonight will explore the emerging scholarship of sickness as a critical methodology and how it might be useful in humanizing medical care for those living with chronic illness or disability. Rooted in feminist theory and disability studies, 
Sickness as a methodology considers not only the embodied felt experience of living with illness, but also the politics of navigating healthcare as a body that biomedicine cannot fix. Jen draws on lived experiences of chronic illness and disability, including that from their own life, to propose a methodological framework that privileges care over cure and counters conventional understandings of health and wellness. Lauren Turner is a disabled poet and essayist. Her chapbook, We're Not Going to Do Better Next Time, was published by Knife Work Book in 2018, and her full-length debut, The Only Card in the Deck of Knives, came out with Wool Second Win in August 2020. Her work has appeared in Grain, Arc Magazine, Prism International, Poetry is Dead, Cosmonauts Avenue, The Maynard, The Puritan, Bad Nudes, Anthias, and elsewhere. She won the 2018 Short Grain Contest, was a finalist for Carte Blanche's 2017 Three Max Prize, and made the long list for Room Magazine's 2019 Creative Nonfiction Contest. Originally from Ottawa, she lives in Montreal on the unceded land of a nation that I can only read. Uh, her bio is on our website if you would like to also read that nation. Um, and Lauren tonight will provide a poetic reading and reflection for um, all of you. So without further ado, um, I would like to invite uh, Jen Sebring to get started. Thank you so much, Jen. Hi. Um, thank you all. I'm just going to share my screen here and get set up. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Nick, and thank you to Leslie Fletcher for having me here today. I'm really excited about this collaboration. Um, so, yeah, I'll get started. I don't need to go too much into um, my own introduction because that was all covered, but I do just want to highlight uh, that I do have lived experience of chronic illness and disability, and that is a lot of what uh, motivates my research. And um, I'm gonna just share a little bit about that for context it, um, because it comes relevant later on. Um, so when I was 13, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And then a week later, I had two grand mal seizures and was diagnosed with epilepsy. And then things were pretty stable until I reached adulthood and moved out on my own. And then I started having seizures almost daily. And um, it was determined that they were non-epileptic. So the doctors described it as being like a way my body manages stress. Um, so that's definitely shaped my experience and is important um, to how I came across sick theories and why it resonated with me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, sickness um, as chronic illness. Um, there hasn't been a lot of work done on theorizing chronic illness and I'll talk a bit more about that. But there has been, within the last few years, this emergence of uh, critical sickness and uh, sick theories, and I found it really interesting, so I thought I would talk about it today. Uh, and I just wanted to note terminology. There's a lot of interchangeable names for chronic illness. Uh, typically, chronic disease refers to a very specific set of illnesses, such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, etc. Um, but I'm more interested in chronic illness as kind of a general experience. And so I use a more, I guess, vague definition um, as listed here, conditions that last a year or more and require ongoing medical attention and or limit activities of daily living. And I just want to highlight there that when I think of chronic illness, I'm not necessarily thinking of um, diagnoses and a lot of my work looks at people who have uh, what are called medically unexplained symptoms, so they don't yet have a diagnosis. Uh, so um, in my undergrad, I did a lot of work, obviously, in feminist theory as a women's and gender studies student, but also I took an interest in disability studies. And I found that a lot of the literature did resonate with my experience, except there were some, some things that just quite didn't quite fit with um, living with chronic illness. And I just want to say that I do um, associate myself more with chronic illness than disability. Um, but this is kind of because disability studies and its activist history has worked really hard to like reject cure and distance themselves from medical intervention and to kind of change the perspective about how we think about disability. So, um, 
One example of this is the social model of disability, where it's not the fact that someone is in a wheelchair that makes them disabled, it's the fact that um, buildings are built without uh, ramps. So it's just kind of like repositioning that. And at the same time, um, there's a move away from like being associated with any kind of sickness or illness that needs to be cured. Uh, so that does bring up tensions. And this is talked about a little bit in disability studies literature, but not a lot. Tensions with chronic illness where there's this kind of ambivalence or even a desire for cure a lot of the time. Like I can speak to this in myself, like if there was a cure for type 1 diabetes tomorrow and it was accessible to everyone, I would most likely take it even though I appreciate like everything I have gained from living with it. And then also on the same um, point, people with chronic illness are often dependent on medical intervention to sustain, you know, their well-being. Whereas people with disabilities that or sorry, disabilities aren't necessarily um, to the same extent. So then when we think about sickness, typically in the way our kind of medical um, care models are set up is that as um, Aurora Levins Morales says, infectious diseases are a model of sickness and wheelchair users are a model of disability. And I think we're seeing this a lot with uh, COVID. Um, I've noticed that, you know, like fighting this infectious disease is something biomedicine has been really effective at. They have a vaccine, but then there's more kind of bewilderment around the phenomenon of COVID long haulers where people are having post-viral symptoms and there's a lot of kind of mystery and unknowns there. Uh, so I thought that this um, yeah, quote summarizes that nicely in that we don't necessarily have a model that's built on um, treating chronic illness or something over a long term that doesn't have a cure. So in saying that, I wanted to uh, recognize some of the work that has been done on chronic illness. So there's been a long-standing recognition of a need for more effective care models for chronic illness. So this kind of goes to what I was saying before that our um, healthcare is kind of built to, you know, treat the person or like identify what's wrong, treat them, send them on their way, and then, you know, they're good to go. Um, but on that same note, there's been a lot of phenomenological research for understanding the illness experience from the point of view of like living with an illness. Like, what is that like? Um, how does that, how do people make meaning of that? How do they integrate that into their life and their understanding of themselves? And I'm seeing a lot of research on this and especially in the field of nursing. Um, so that's great because it clearly has implications for patient care. And then of course, we're also seeing more and more chronic illness uh, because people are living longer lives and more and more things are uh, able to be treated. Like the example of HIV and AIDS, a lot of the time it's framed as not so much as an acute um, illness now, but like a long-term illness. So we're just, we're seeing these advances in medical technology and that's meaning that people are living with chronic illnesses. Um, and also really important to sick theories is that we're starting to recognize that there's this really complex interplay between like our social world and our environment and our biology. And um, these things are being recognized through like health equity frameworks, recognizing systemic inequities such as racism and ableism and sexism, and um, also social determinants and structural determinants of health. And we're also starting to see more and more research on how trauma, like experiencing a trauma, can affect your health and um, also chronic stress. So um, despite all that, there's still kind of the question of what about those who are, as Margaret Childrick says, living on and not getting better. So here I'm thinking about um, the, what I mentioned before, like people with medically unexplained symptoms or the kind of like contested illnesses such as fibromyalgia or multiple chemical sensitivities. And they're, you know, seeing different specialists for like up to seven years before they get a diagnosis or maybe they're not able to access healthcare for different reasons. And there's just 
um, a lot of different ways to think about this. So I think that's kind of uh, where the brilliance of sick theories comes into play. So Johanna Hedva penned an essay, uh, Sick Woman Theory, in 2016. And I think that kind of saw the rise of um, this literature on sick theories. So basically, uh, Hedva speaks to their own experience as someone living with multiple chronic illnesses. And they, um, they have some that are diagnosed and some that are kind of elusive and um, they're struggling, struggling with like finding answers for them through the medical model of care. So they start to think about their illness in different ways. Like maybe their illness is a result of like their, the inter, intergenerational trauma that their immigrant family faced or the insecure housing they had growing up and things like this. And they write that in a very explicitly political way that maybe chronic illness is really that our bodies are reactive and sensitive to regimes of oppression. And maybe these symptoms are like an embodied resistance to that. Um, so I just wanna highlight here that obviously through this lens, not all chronic illness is going to fit into this idea of sick theories, but um, I was, it's still, I think, important uh, to how we think about chronic illness. And then linked to the idea of trauma, um, this is kind of what sick theories really gets at is that maybe the systemic oppression that we are navigating in our everyday lives, whether it be like ableism or racism, sexism, transphobia, you know, the list goes on, these structures, maybe navigating them is a kind of trauma in and of itself, but in this like everyday kind of accumulated way, or I refer to them sometimes as micro traumas. And then also in thinking about these things, um, as humans, we were kind of inherently vulnerable in a lot of ways. And um, Hedva looks to the work of Judith Butler to talk about this, but it's important to note that because of systemic oppression, some bodies are made more vulnerable than other bodies. And then finally, if we're thinking about all of this, there's also what becomes clear is that there's an absence of the care or at least the care we need and for the people who need it. And I don't mean this just in terms of healthcare, but like kind of our overall capacity to care for one another and over long periods of time and through uncertainty and thinking about all of these things. Um, so when you think, think about this in terms of like systematic oppression and absence of care, I'm reminded of the people who have barriers to healthcare um, and how they're, you know, they're facing this ongoing trauma, but they don't have a means to, um, you know, get support for that. So I think that's important to think about as well. Um, so science does support this idea of traumatic events and chronic stressors um, influencing people's development of chronic illness. So I'm not gonna do a whole like neurobiology lecture here, but basically when you experience a tra traumatic event, your nervous system activates and usually you can integrate that event and you know everything kind of calms down and you're back to your normal like um, homeostasis, you know, like your normal level of functioning. But sometimes our nervous systems remain activated or they get stuck on. And that kind of like hyper drive of the nervous system can, um, it has a whole bunch of effects, like physiological effects on the body. And a lot of these are being linked to chronic illness in like newer research. Um, so I have some citations there. And I also want to say like a really important aspect of sick theories that um, Margot Feldman talks about in their um, dissertation they just defended is that maybe sick theories, sick theories is an intervention to trauma studies in that trauma is usually looked at as like a singular event affecting one person. And it's like that individual's failure to integrate or like properly respond to that event that leads them to this dysregulated state of their nervous system. And so sick theories 
kind of reframes that and thinks about trauma as like this cumulative idea, cumulative adversity and chronic stress, like these everyday micro traumas of living in like a patriarchal um, capitalist society with all these intense pressures and um, barriers and and so forth. And so, yeah, so their note here is that it's maybe less so an individual problem, an unfortunate event that happens to one person, but more so a pervasive issue that's present in most of our everyday life. So maybe we need to look at trauma and like trauma-informed care on a societal level. And I'm thinking, I think a lot about this, um, as I said before, like how do, how do we cope with trauma if trauma is systemic, if it's the accumulation of everyday stressors? Like how do you have the resources to deal with that on an ongoing basis if you're always kind of being worn down by these um, structures and stresses? So um, in my experience of like communicating with other people with chronic illnesses and disability, the idea of medical trauma comes up a lot. So trauma that results from a like critical medical event, such as like um, a stroke or a emergency surgery, things like that. Um, and also, as I noted before, chronic stress or cumulative adversity can lead to chronic illness. So these are things that we know, and I was thinking about my own experience and kind of thinking about my own privilege in that I hadn't really experienced like a critical medical event. And I wasn't sure what a like chronic everyday stressor would be in my life. Um, what I did, did realize though, or my question was, is can living with chronic illness trigger a chronic trauma response? Because, and I was wondering this because all of a sudden I had this onset of these non-epileptic seizures or what were determined to be non-epileptic seizures. And I wasn't really sure like what was so stressful in my life, I guess. But I did think about living with diabetes and epilepsy and chronic illness and how, well, it's inherently um, anxiety invoking when you're worried like, about low blood sugars or high blood sugars or having a seizure or all these things, but also that navigating healthcare interactions and especially for an illness that came with a lot of uncertainty and was difficult to diagnose was a really difficult and um, was a very difficult and sometimes traumatic response to kind of be dismissed and invalidated again and again at appointments. Um, so I thought a lot about that and also about how medical and healthcare systems, like as, as a kind of institution in some ways, how are they implicated in perpetuating systemic oppression? And can receiving and navigating care, or at least in the way I experienced for chronic illness be a kind of micro trauma or chronic stressor? And yes, these are questions that came from my everyday life, but there are also questions and stories and struggles from the broader community of people with chronic illnesses that I've been connected to for a long time. Um, so I think sick theories gave me a way of kind of reframing my experience and it was really helpful. Um, and now it's motivated a lot of my research to look at the ways that we can like improve healthcare to be, to, you know, be a kind of facilitator of um, resiliency and I know trauma informed care is like a huge response to this in a lot of ways. Um, but anyways, through thinking about these things, I was thinking about as Hedva, Hedva writes, chronic illness as the trauma of not being seen. And I've recently been doing research on uh, transgender access to health care and it is Overwhelmingly, transgender people have very negative experiences accessing uh, healthcare because of transphobia and places not using their pronouns and assuming their gender or just like being really uncomfortable giving them care. So I thought about this, and this can be interpreted in a lot of ways, uh, the trauma of not being seen. 
And I've thought about this in the way that um, in my own experience, like when I was diagnosed and in hospitalized for diabetes that I kind of felt a loss of bodily autonomy and there was all these decisions being made and a lot of things happening and I wasn't really uh, like consulted, like I kind of felt disconnected and I was kind of drawn into the like um, really like survivor warrior kind of narrative and there was no room for me to really like feel things and be like holy, like, this is really scary and really hard and all of these things. Um, and I think that's the same thing in, like, healthcare interactions. Like, what would it mean to, like, really, like, acknowledge the person there and their struggle and, like, see them as a really complex human? Because they are and we all are. And so I think, yeah, I think this is a really interesting way of thinking about um, I think even like women's concerns, health concerns are shown to be dismissed and invalidated. And black women, for example, have three times the uh, mortality rate in pregnancy. And there's been more and more instances of people sharing these stories of being like invalidated or dismissed or not taken seriously or told it's all in their head. And I wonder like how often does that end up like really staying with them and affecting their well-being over a long term. So Hedva puts it really beautifully when they say that sickness is for those who are faced with their vulnerability and unbearable fragility every day and so have to fight for their experience to not only be honored but first made visible. For those who, in Audre Lorde's words, were never meant to survive because this world is built against their survival. So now what I'm kind of working through and thinking about as I um, am starting my master's thesis is what does the politics of sickness look like in practice? And as I mentioned before, trauma-informed care is a good start. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of constraints, of course. Um, so it's like, do we, when we're thinking about healthcare, like what is how much time is required to enact this kind of like holistic person-centered care and what are the resources we need? And it, I think it really, Sick Theories presents the need for a kind of overhaul in the way we think about illness and disease. And I think that relates back to the trauma of not being seen also in that through meta, um, biomedicine's current like reductionist view of the body in that disease is like a discrete entity. We fail to look at a person holistically. And this problem is taken up a lot in the literature now, and that's really promising, promising to see. But I know that still this is a really complicated question because it does involve a reframing of care and medicine, and even like reframing of how we interact with each other and care for each other more generally. Um, and I just wanna highlight the work of Black feminists and, and also disability justice organizers, they have a lot of brilliant answers for what care can look like when we start imagining new possibilities. Uh, so that's all I have to share right now. And I wanna thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was so fascinating and so much to think about. And I am not going to talk any longer because I think Lauren is uh, the perfect person to follow this up. So Lauren, uh, welcome. And I can't wait to hear you read. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks to Nick for hosting. Uh, Nick and I know each other from Instagram. So it's nice to be able to meet in this venue because <laughs> don't really get that chance anymore to see people. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank Leslie at the League of Canadian Poets for inviting me to read at this event. I was really excited when I saw the event description, especially after I learned what Jen would be presenting on and their talk was truly enthralling to listen to. So thank you to them as well for sharing the space with me. Um, the book I'm going to read from is called The Only Car Deck of Knives. It came out in August with Will Sack and Wynn, and it very much just focuses around um, my experience of being diagnosed with a chronic illness called LAM, 
uh, which is a pulmonary disease that causes benign growth in the lungs uh, that eventually leads to lung failure. So the prognosis is not, not great. Um, and I got this diagnosis when I was 26, which is, you know, 20 is such a formative time. So it was very, there's never going to be a good time to get a diagnosis like that, but um, it was a very strange experience. And so it was difficult to navigate along with the other big life things that were going on. And also um, in getting that kind of diagnosis, you do have to navigate other people's feelings about it. So, <laughs> which sometimes results in some unwanted contact. So the poem I'm gonna read is something that I wrote in response to getting an email from an ex-boyfriend about the diagnosis. <laughs> completely gutted to hear of your diagnosis. Dear ex, I took your letter to the place where I could no longer respond, and you sat shrouded like my future funeral with its chrome-rimmed cars and throaty orchids. This doesn't obscure how I carry you, breathy as an organ under latex. That's right, girl, don't move another muscle. In someone else's book, our narrative could appease atonement a violet found parting snow, only to be crystallized for a wedding cake. Look, I made you peek into our past foyer when nothing is sacred enough to forgive. Wax could seal my reply and snag your tail as a cooled comet, rushing the Aurora streets from her bed. History enshrines what happens next. The bar is loud, spirits flow on. Come toast this last apocalyptic hour, what we meant to absolve at Nouveau Palais. Another plan folded, our trice never tucked neatly as sex. I'd like to say we had our way with one another, but memory fault lines and swallows the shell from every shot. If I can't pigeonhole your intent, I have nothing to fire back. A chorus girl on stage in pasty tassels serenades they don't get your forgiveness just because you're dying belongs in a poem until it buries my lead. I'll hold tight to burst your romance as my gold suited grenade takes a seat. Cleave us a night with sighs of no one deserves this less than you. Tell me how to pardon at entrance these runes for once they weren't yours. So I have two lyric essays in the book, and I thought to read this one tonight because I um, got to hear a little bit from Jen about what their presentation would touch on last week. So I thought that this was one of the pieces that could hopefully um, exist in conversation with their presentation. And um, try to think of how to contextualize it. I guess it's useful <laughs> to mention um, that it does conflate certain ideas around gendered illness and gendered violence. So just trigger warning for sexual assault. Um, for LAM, my respiratory disease, it's characterized online if you look it up as being like a women's disease. And obviously there's a lot of problems with categorizing a disease that way. And as another item of context, um, I also mentioned uh, the Cuban American performance artist Ana Mendieta who um, many people believe was murdered by her husband, although he was tried and acquitted for her murder. And her work largely um, touches on, well, in the 70s, she was doing a lot of pieces on sexual assault that involved like blood and revive visceral. So those get mentioned as well. But I think that's enough of an intro, so I'm gonna dive into it. A masculine division. X equals the given value of zero multiplied by the largest number of fathomable still equals zero. Dying, I equals zero. A woman who accuses a man equals zero. A picket line of chanting women equals zero, whether they aim to break men like they were broken. Men can't be crumpled down to zero, yet women are born there. I read a memoir where the author divided her illness by men. This arithmetic isn't useful to me, and I have actively employed it. 
In her book, there was a series of villainous, mediocre men before a healer arrived. He became her prophet, naturally, as in it's natural that existence be deciphered into phrases by male-faced gods. This is another act of division. Many illnesses possess psychological attributes parsed from the physical realm. Often a sick woman is deemed entirely psychological, her symptoms a delusion of the synapses. Biology alleges that cis women have a higher pain threshold than cis men. I imagine the evolutionary trigger is generations of women miscarrying their stifled, ignored pain, but science wants to answer childbirth. X equals ignoring female pain is an act of violence. A bridge violence against women with an illness thought to affect only women and the illness becomes a violence killing women. It segregates healthy cells from the maimed, striking repeatedly any interior that remains untouched. Every part of a woman must be touched. My disease is female gendered. The afflicted cohort calls themselves lammies, sports pink feather pins, and bemoans the babies deflating their lungs. I commit none of these acts, presuming myself above it all and being medically barred from reproduction. I refuse to join the league of dying women who believe grief is impolite, somehow unfeminine, and should be hidden. Scrolling through medical journals, I find four men diagnosed with my illness. The internet has erased whether they lived or didn't, or if their diagnosis stuck. When trans or non-binary folks are diagnosed, the internet fails to acknowledge them. This erasure is worth discussing. Explain the collective impulse of society and medicine to cast a disease in pink or blue like a gender reveal party. I can't, but I also haven't tried. Humanity erases its humanity to keep prejudices intact. X equals a hospital gastroenterologist refers me for a physically invasive test without Googling my disease. I had waited six months to see him and he declined to take a minute to learn what's killing me. X equals a stranger online explains that male doctors would take me seriously if I performed a toxic masculinity, filling the examination room with a thrashing entitled rage. I'm fascinated by how he mechanics of that scene would run. My good man, the physicians already suspect I'm hysteric. Don't su suggest I twofold the issue. Gendered violence draws years from me, first in the form of abuse, then again when the illness anchors. My illness feels at times like another ruthless man with a bone to pick or organs to tumor. This act of division is intentional. Reducing my sick body to a struggle against a masculine force. If that analogy angers you, it was intended to. Men divided my life by their wills and desires until I was nothing more than inanimate skin. If you assume I have internalized a hatred of men, ask those men why they hate women and then reconsider. I stop reading the memoirs of sick women and begin reading scholarship about a Cuban American artist fallen from her 34th floor window, allegedly pushed, allegedly murdered, allegedly by her husband who was older, white, and an artist himself, his fame teetering on being eclipsed by his wife's genius. She can't by men and men, allegedly. It should bother you that I haven't paused to type out her name. X equals what if she was your wife or daughter is a query often posed to men online. Visualize me as belonging to you or being of your seed. 
This equation is the singular solution to caring about wronged, sick, raped, murdered, or dying women. X equals when a male writer divides his narrative by women, are they real women or feminized objects? Do the women control their bodies or succumb to his authorial puppet strings? For fun, pillar my narrative with men. Here are my ex-boyfriends. Here's the ex who assaulted me. Here's the stranger who assaulted me. Here is their staunch brutality staged in crowded settings where the eyewitnesses turn to salt or so their silence suggests. Here are the unsympathetic physicians. Here's the pain they wouldn't treat or diagnose. Here for our grand finale is my partner and his unrelenting care. Pretend the validation of one man adds up to a tourniquet for everything else. X equals increases in dead women leads to a decrease in societal concern, suggesting that mounting death tolls have become normalized. Another tragic headline, another pretty name to forget. Anna Mandietta only encountered Sarah Ottens in death. Sarah's killer left a bloody footprint on her dorm room faucets. Anna's new husband was found with fresh scratches on his face, his wife bleeding out on a deli roof in her blue, blue, blue panties. But the chronology is skewed here. Sarah left Earth in 1973, and Anna, very much alive, kept her memory an open wound in untitled rape performance and sweating blood. The women didn't meet until Anna played at Sarah's assault in her Iowa apartment, her door ajar for others to filter inside and live the death. Anna bound, covered with slaughterhouse gore and splayed, extending herself into the void to comfort the inconsolable Sarah. X equals society insists women's activism be gentle but society doesn't handle win women gently. So let the cattle blood and viscera flood the doorsteps. It's not like anyone will call the cops. No worldly substance behaves with more tenderness than blood. X equals, unless I can be convincingly imagined as cut from Adam's rib, am I refused personhood? This theory hinges entirely on how the viewer sees Adam. If he is envisioned as a pious, homophobic, slut-shaming bigot of a white guy, I'm in trouble, and so are most women. I get lost in the cold cases of dead women and forget to plead my own case, forfeiting any chance of winning it. What form could a victory even take? Men abuse me and now I'm dying, but not of any abuse, although on my worst days, I recollect my early 20s and hypothesize that I poisoned my body with bad men. It wasn't the bad men's fault, I reminisce, when I followed them out of safety and into alleyways, bedrooms, front halls, woods, anonymous parties, nearby towns, and other people's homes. Those choices were my own. It wouldn't matter if I stamped out survivor for shared culpability. My verdict is already known to me. A disease can't be equated to an abuser. The parallel is imperfect, as is memory and self-narrative. Write it down if you like that this comparison is ill-advised. After the Kavanaugh confirmation, everything I allege feels heavy with errors, my history thickened by ghosts I can't live beyond. I would recant every allegation to be left alone, free from the media circus called restorative justice, oblivious to death threats, harassment, and terrors I couldn't imagine until I met them. X equals 
So what if I bury the hatchet in my own chest? Do you think this autoparotic impulse represents me? Hemorrhaging energy and diseased cells down my book's spine. So I'm gonna read one more. I think the ethical and kind thing to do after reading such an intense poem is to read something gentler. Um, and this poem doesn't have anything explicitly to do with illness or disability. Um, but uh, when I was writing it, it was the summer, not this past summer, because there wasn't a pandemic happening, but the previous one, I was sitting on a terrace with my laptop trying to write poems and wishing that my friend was there. So I'm just going to leave you with that. Oh, and then before I do, I should say thank you to everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. Cancer season reprise. I need my decisions to appear uninfluenced by the sway of others. This table is beautifully set with its mosaic of Portuguese tiles. I wish you were here. It's hard to share in experiences alone. I confide too often. Everybody knows I feel like the only card in a deck of knives or that my actions are coerced into the slimmest margins of error and ending move. Men I know assume I lived five years ago. I try to say otherwise or not recognize that I can't. This sentiment is a reprise to a poem with a distortion for its name. I'm so violently tired, anemic with want, siphoned out. I wade fading into, into the indigo tide of this July. You pass me a cigarette to satiate a compulsion I didn't even need filled. Listen to that. I didn't need for once. It could. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was amazing. I know you've got um, some kind words in the uh, in the chat. Um, I'm going to add Jen back here with a spotlight. Um, and so so many so many kind words in the chat. Um, and I'm I'm going to open the floor to questions from anybody. We have um, eleven minutes before we need to wrap up. And uh, I don't have anything else to say other than, than the, other than that the next event will be on March 31st. Um, so feel free to raise your hand or and, and unmute yourself or um, pop in the chat if you have a question. Um, and while we wait for questions, Jen and Lauren, feel free to chat with each other because like that's a conversation I would love to witness. <laughs> um Jen I'm gonna like reveal a little secret um you you actually listed Lauren as like a poet that you would love to chat with um so I'm curious to know um how how you came across Lauren's poetry or um what I mean it seems obvious what spoke to you, but I'm not, I don't want to put that in your mouth, you know? So what um, like spoke to you about Lauren's poetry? We actually, um, I think we were following each other on Instagram and I know we had like some interactions on there cause like that's where a lot of kind of the like sick sickness and activism happens when we're all like sick <laughs> and in bed. There's a lot of great conversations and things that happen there and I had taken a break from Instagram and then when I was approached about this, Lauren seemed really familiar and then I realized that was why. Um, but yeah, like I think the second poem especially that she read was like just so spoke to all the things I like was trying to hint at at my presentation. So I think that was a really like beautiful uh, collaboration in that way. Thank you. It's so funny. It feels like the only way to meet anyone when you're sick is on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
No, I really appreciate that you like thought of me and asked. It was like, I was really happy because um, Leslie actually passed that along. Or did you actually, Nick? Someone told me that before. And I was like, wow, someone wants to read with me. <laughs> and you researched you. I just really enjoyed your presentation. So I'm glad that we could able to like fuse the two things together. I, I am also glad for it. Um, Lauren, we have a question for you from sure. Blythe McKay, um, who is asking, did you write poetry before your diagnosis? And how did your diagnosis change what you wrote about? Yeah, I definitely did. I actually had a different manuscript that I had intended on being my first book. And then when I was in the middle of editing it, I got the diagnosis and it just made the manuscript seem kind of I don't know if frivolous is the right word, but I just didn't feel connected to it anymore. So I just wanted to start over and which is what I did. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Got a, a couple more compliments and um, Blythe says thanks. Um, let me check for hands raised. Katarina suggests uh, sharing your research and your poetry, both of you, with the chief medical officer to affect real change. <laughs> um, I'm just, I haven't pre-read this. Chrissy Kelly has written, I work with Jen at U of M and I want everyone to know that Jen actually did a lecture for the medical students. And Lauren, I'm wondering if you have had a chance to read your poetry to a medical audience. I haven't. Oh, that's definitely something that I'd be interested in. Yeah, so it's actually the first time I've been able to, I think, do an event that was actually more focused on like the areas of illness and medicine. So it was really quite a treat for me, but definitely would like love more opportunities like this. Yeah, we had kind of spoke about like my experience lecturing with the medical students and how like wonderfully receptive they were and um, I don't know, it was really exciting to get to engage with them. And I really like appreciate this health humanities in general is making these kind of conversations possible. So. Maybe this can be a um, jumping off point and we can get Lauren in front of some more medical audiences. <laughs> um, Tom, I noticed your hand is up. I don't know how long it's been because I only just now noticed where that information is given to me on the screen. <laughs> Wait, did it go back down? Uh, it did, but only because you said that. It, it's okay. only been up for it's only been up for a moment. Okay. <laughs> thank you for worrying about that. Uh, thank thank you both for your for your contribution. I I wanted to point out uh, an overlap between them. Uh, so you, you were just saying that you haven't spoken with a medical. Uh, you haven't often. You haven't, uh, uh, Lauren. You haven't. Uh, um, given a poetry reading to a medical audience. You can say now that you have, because I'm a physician, so at least for a, a medical audience of one, uh, you've, you've done it. I'm not sure how many other physicians are on the, on the Zoom today. Uh, there was an overlap between your, your talks that related to what I did before medicine, which was mathematics. Uh, Lauren, you had a lot of uh, references to algebra. Uh, and uh, Jen, when you were speaking, I really had Venn diagrams going through my head, uh, looking <laughs> at the overlap or non-overlap between illness, uh, sickness, uh, and some of the other term, disability, and some of the other terms that you used. And I, I just wondered, and, and, and maybe going back to Lauren, there was very much a male-female tension in, in, your, in your poems. Uh, and perhaps in your in your life as well, uh, that, that your poems that your poems reflect. Uh, I, I just wanted to find out from both of you the degree to which this this uh, dividing of the world into two parts, which is a very Western view of the world, uh, how that influences the way that you think about these topics and and explore them. Thank you. You want to answer first? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. And I think it definitely does. I feel like a lot of the time when I'm thinking through different problems or experiences, like it really comes down to these really simplified views of things. And um, 
I'm like trying to both work with this in my research and just in my everyday is like really leaning into and holding space for complexity and like uncertainty. Um, I wanna name the writing of Adrian Marie Brown. She writes about, it's called emergence theory, but just like how can we be together in the world and like hold space for all this complexity and it's really brilliant. But um, yeah, I think that's definitely like a huge tension that we have to like grapple with. And I'm never really sure how to work with it when it's so like entrenched in everything we do and the ways we think in yeah Western thinking specifically. Yeah, um, <laughs> to answer the question for my work, I'm not sure that I was so interested in dualism. I think really for me, the, the work was more interested in like the ideas of like a gendered illness versus like gendered violence and kind of just like creating like a history of um, the body. So I think sometimes you end up with um, binaries like healthy versus unwell and things like that. But I don't think I ever set out with um, the intention to make things so black and white. So I hope that there's a lot of gray area still in my writing. Thank you both. Um, we are three minutes away from seven and I do know um, that it's not seven in BC. So people need to, to leave. Um, Jen, if you wanna answer one more question, knowing that some people might, might leave and they're all sending you compliments in the um, chat, uh, someone had asked if you felt like you needed to present things differently for a medical audience. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I really, was thinking about that um, a lot when I was preparing my presentation. I think it helped that it was like first year medical students. Um, also that I actually knew a few of them, like grew up with them and stuff, just like the small world that Winnipeg is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I really like with this presentation, I brought in six theories because I thought there was more room for the kind of politics, whereas like, health is often, or like research and medicine are like seen as objective kind of apolitical things. So I thought about like, what could I offer them that would actually be, that they could integrate into their training and like their interactions with patients. So it was very like, I guess, action oriented. Like these are the things that have been not so great in my experience. And these are the things that have been really helpful in, and just like really emphasizing the, kind of like power dynamics, I guess, in the patient and provider context, just like some things to like think with as they move through their education, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Thank you so much. Um, okay, well, that is a wrap for us tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much, Jen and Lauren. That was um, really, really wonderful. And the next one of these is the last Wednesday of March, which is the 31st. Um, we don't have our speakers lined up yet. If you register for the whole series, you'll be registered for that one as well. Um, otherwise, I'd encourage you to check out our website. It's poets.ca slash cross hyphen pollinations. Um, and that's where you can find all the information. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Um, drink lots of water. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>